encourage you to uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. This morning we're going to be uh, studying from chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. We have these many weeks been going through the tribulation period, that seven year period with which I promise you it wasn't going to take us seven years to get through it. You had your doubts at the very beginning, I know, but uh, we are uh, making making it through. Chapter 18 is a glorious chapter of judgment. Judgment that is coming in the future. Judgment that is on that old city and system of Babylon. Last week we looked at sort of the religious, one world religious rebuke in chapter 17. And this morning we get the other side of that, which is the geopolitical, the economic rebuke on that system. And so this morning I just uh, want to begin our time in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we look at your word this morning, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, as we look at this uh, future judgment, we realize, Lord, that your word is full of warnings for us, even in the here and now. Lord, that we are not to associate with worldliness. We're not to to give our lives to hedonism. We're no longer to trust in materialism. Lord, we are to be solely separated unto you for your glory and your purpose. And so, Father, this morning as we look at this text, I pray that you might purify our own hearts. Again, it is so tempting For us to go back into the ways of the world and the thinking of the world and the supposed safety of of that which men have made idols out of. And Lord, even our hearts tend to trust in and be comforted by. Father, we just... uh, We ask, Lord, that you would do a work in our midst this morning. Give us understanding of these things. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I want you to keep your finger there in Revelation 18 and turn in your Bibles to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15. As a preacher, I am always listening to sermons. You might not know that about me. I I love sermons. I love to preach them, and I love to listen to them. I love preaching. And so one of the the people, one of the persons that I uh, love to to hear uh, preached a sermon one time, and he started with this text in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. And the first thing he said, he goes, I really want you to get in your Bibles, find this passage. And so you could hear, even over the recording, pages stumbling through, you know, shuffling through, and you're you're going, okay, what, you know? And he's he's waiting a long time with this, and people are shuffling through, and he goes, I just really want to make sure this is still in your Bible. Let's read it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away. And we'll stop there. He goes on to say that even in church circles, even in our life as as the American Christianity, it seems as though we have slipped into what he called an unending yes. 
That is a heartfelt embracing of, of all that the world would, would offer us. And so we had this, this montage of a collage of Christian ideas and, and, and those that came from the world. We've got this smorgasbord going on. Where you just kind of go in and, and pick what you choose and, and choose what you may. And just, you know, make for yourself some sort of ideologic salad. But here in this text, by the way, that's still in your Bibles, is still in mine. Says this, listen, we, we are to separate out from these ideologies. The ideology of the world that would say, you know, if you really want to trust in something, then you ought to trust in yourself. And if you can't trust in yourself, maybe it is because you haven't gotten the world's possessions or you don't have enough. And so you've always acquiring more. And the more you acquire the worldly lies, the more you will have a sense of safe, uh, safety and, and you will have a good life. Right? Isn't the world say, he who, who, who uh, has the most toys wins, right? And so we have rampant materialism and the unending yes. And then we have the world that comes along and says with great hedonism, listen, it is all about the way that you feel. And we have the people defining their lives and even their genders based on what they feel and how they feel. And they do whatever it is that makes them feel good. And, and so life revolves around hedonism that is all that would make you feel good. And so the world is full of these ideologies, full of uh, un unending sense of, of Ways in which the world, the flesh, and the enemy can subtract, uh, or distract rather, and delude even the believer's sense of true treasure. Where is your true treasure this morning? Is it in the old, old story? Do you love to tell it? Or, or has it... Has it been diluted by materialism? Has it been diluted and polluted by hedonism? By pride? By lust? For in this text, 1 John tells us, it is passing away. The, the, the Lord, in His gracious mercy is going to bring about an end to all of these idolatries and all of these idle thoughts and all of these things that will never really please nor satisfy. He will bring an end to all of them. And we live with that evidence all the time. We don't necessarily have to go to Revelation 18 and see how God then really judges materialism and those who trust in the economy for their, their, uh, for their safety and security and, and all of these things for their joy. Now all we have to do is go to a funeral. All we have to do is go to a funeral. Right? He who... Dies with the most toys, what? Still dies. Still dies. There's an end to it. It is passing away. It is passing away. Now go back to Revelation 18. There's a lot I could say about these ideologies, materialism, trusting in man's own resources, Doing all that, that makes him feel good and in a sense of hedonism. But here in Revelation 18, we've got to get into the text this morning. 
We're going to see that God is going to judge. He's going to bring judgment on these things because, and mercifully so, because it is in him and him alone. Do we truly ever find true satisfaction, true joy? Our treasure is in our creator, our sustainer our Lord and Savior. And everything else is just an imitation. Everything else is is just an idolatrous lie. A system that has been puffed up and sustained and, 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 and in the context of this, in the future, Willie is amassed a lot of temporal power and wealth. And it's taken up speed. It's the one world economic system. And it's booming. And then it blows up. So the worldly lie again says. These are the things that you need. To truly satisfy. But the word of God tells us. No, no. Do not love the world Do not fall back into worldliness. He would say to the Christians and to the Christians living in the here and now, don't fall back into that. Find your true satisfaction and your true love for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is all about Him and revelation we have seen is His unveiling. He is coming. He is coming. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. The sovereign one. The holy one. He's coming. So in chapter 18 here. We are going again. We're going to see God's judgment on Babylon. As we said last week. I believe that there will be a future power. An actual city, there is a city, and it is going to get even larger and be re- rebuilt and will probably become the, the city, city center of this system. So as we unfold this text here, we're looking at a system, we're looking at an ideology, and it's all pouring out, I think, in, uh, uh, out of a very central city in the world, Babylon. And it is at this point in our seven-year trek through through the Great Tribulation, or the Tribulation, the last three and a half years being the Great Tribulation, that it is this uh, time when when Satan has empowered the, the Antichrist with his false prophet, with his great machinery, with all the world's kings lined up underneath him, and all the power and all the economy creating this great, great, grand culture. In a sense, they are trying to fulfill that which they tried to fulfill all the way back into Genesis with the Tower of Babel. We're going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to to build this great tower right up into the heavens. And Satan's method is, again, to sustain his power here in the world as the prince of the power of the air. But Jesus is coming back. And he's putting a judgment to all of these things. And we've seen the seven seal judgments. And we've seen the seven trumpet judgments. And we've seen the seven bowl judgments. And this is in the midst here of the seven bowl judgments. What is happening here in chapter 18. We're getting a blown up picture of the economic ruin. The economic crisis the economic explosion and destruction of Babylon. Look at the text with me. Chapter 18, verse 1. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having a great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen! Fallen in his Babylon the great. 
She's become a dwelling place of demons and the prison of every unclean spirit and the prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For the nations have drunken the wine of the passion of her immorality and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants of earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you might, be, might not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid and, and give back her double account for her deeds. And the cup in which she has mixed, mixed twice much for her, for the degree in which she glorified herself and lived sensuously to the, degree, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow, for I will never see mourning. And for this reason, one day of her plagues will come and pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, and the Lord God who judges her is strong. This morning, I want us to see three sections in this text. Three sections in this entire chapter. I just gave you the first section, the first aspect of this one world economy that is doomed this one world economic system that was self-sustaining and self-glorifying and puffed itself up as a god and made for the whole world an idol. And all of the idol, all of the world drunk of, of this idolatry and became intoxicated by its wealth. And here... God is putting judgment down. God is putting judgment down. This is a false system, a false idol. This is false worship. We, we looked at chapter 17 that, that sort of handled the, the religious aspect, the one world religion that is coming, and God will tear that to pieces. And here, this morning, we look at the other half of that the system of economy, that one world financial powerful system that is coming, and we can see even in our day, has begun. The economic God and its destruction through a prophetic picture of destruction of the city of Babylon. That's what we're looking at this morning. Why? Why? Why look at this? To be reminded, worldliness is passing away. All that the devil would tempt us with, hedonism, materialism, all aspects of worldly, worldlyism, is all passing away. And so the question should be on our minds, where is our affections this morning? Where is our affections where is our loyalty? Where does our loyalty lie? In the almighty do dollar? Or the king of kings and the lord of lords? Where is our affection? What brings true and lasting, satisfying joy in our life? And to what degree in our life is it being diluted with materialism? with hedonism, with any and all aspects of worldly thinking and ideology. ideology. Let's look at that first section. I just read to you the first section. It is the proclamation of judgment here. The proclamation of judgment. There's several parts to this. Look at verses 1 and 2. We have the announcement of the destruction. After these things, I saw an angel coming down from heaven with great power, our great authority, that is, that is, it is God's judgment is passed down through this angel. Again, we've seen the pattern in the uh, 
during this time of tribulation, one after another angel coming down and giving an announcement coming from the throne room of God, chapter uh, 5. And the earth is fully illumined with his glory. God is going to grab the attention. And the proclamation of judgment is stated right here. He cried out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon. And so again, we, we have this prediction and this proclamation of this coming judgment. And the judgment falls on this city, this system, this idolatrous system. It calls itself Babylon the Great. Why? Well, look at verse 8. For this reason, the plagues will come, the pestilence, the mourning... She will be burned up. Why? Uh, actually, it's verse 7. Because she has, uh, has great thoughts about herself. I sit as the queen. I am not a widow. I will never see mourning. She lofty, uh, uh, sits with great lofty thoughts of herself and, and lofty pride. And so the announcement of destruction comes. Verses 2 and 3 sort of fill in some of the charges, or I could say allegations. Allegations, look at verse 2. And then he cried out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place, place of demons, and a prison of every unclean spirit. Another word for demons. And a prison of unclean and hateful birds. Another picture of demons. These are not nice birds. Anybody bird watching? These are not the kind of birds that you like to watch. These are vultures. And there's a visual picture of hateful ver uh, birds. And they are encircling Babylon. Why? Because doom is about to come. Doom is about to come. Why? First allegation, their house is a full of demons. Full of demons. There's all kinds of different manifestations of worldliness going on in Babylon. We talked about the religious aspects of it, but there is also plenty of it in the political and the economic and the materialistic. And it's full we saw in the judgments earlier how that the demons, one third of them that were held captive, were released and poured down on the earth. We saw that they came out of heaven and were poured down on the earth. And so where are they all housed? They're all housed in this system. They're all housed in this system. That's the first allegation. The second allegation is, look at this, their indoctrination. Look at verse 3. They've indoctrinated the entire world for all of the nations, that's global, have drunk of the wine of her passion, of her immorality. And again, that passion of immorality we talked about last week, that is her religious infidelity. Instead of looking to her creator, as Romans 1 says, no, he suppressed the truth and unrighteousness and chose to worship the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so this system, this Babylon the Great has infected and indoctrinated the entire world with that religious system, but also an economic system, a ideological system. And they have drunk the wine of her passion, of her immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich and wealthy in, of her sensuality. And so this chapter really focuses on that last phrase. They've become rich with the wealth of her sensuality. They've been indoctrinated with materialism. 
They've been indoctrinated with humanism. They've been indoctrinated with hedonism. The satisfaction not found in the creator, but the created, the creature, the man made. And so they've been intoxicated. They've been intoxicated by these acts of immorality, uh, not loyalty to the creator, but immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth, the businessmen of the earth have become rich and wealthy uh, with her sensuality. They have really cramped up the materialism. And so this word sensuality is a big part of this uh, chapter And in the Greek, it means arrogant, unrestrained luxury. Have you ever seen unrestrained luxury? When I think about this, I think about my visit to a castle. Ludwig Castle, have you ever seen? You you have no doubt seen castles that Ludwig uh, built. In fact, one of them inspired Disney's uh, castle. But there's another one slightly uh, removed from that property, sort of down the mountain, and it was his last castle. And the man absolutely, in the end of his life, he went mad because he is cranking up taxes and he is spending all of his money on these castles and going through his luxury house. You, you see, there is not a square inch of some of these rooms as big as this room that isn't lined with gold. It is, it is, it's, it's so gaudy, it's gross. It, it's just gross. And then you're, they hear the, uh, the person that's giving you the tour, he's talking, you, they're talking to us about how this man took and he just basically robbed the people of Germany. And he took out loans so that he could build a house of gold for himself. And he went crazy and mad. He's lucky the people didn't lynch him. They almost did. But that's the sense of sensuality here. It's just unrestrained. It's gone crazy. It's mad. It's lunacy. So we've seen the announcement of the, and the uh, allegations of indoctrinations here. Look at verses 4 and 5 here. The appeal for the believer's separation. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate with her in her sins. And receive her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. This is a clear invitation to come to the mercy of God and to abandon participation with those that are uh, destined for destruction. It's a a clear call for, for believers to separate themselves from this ideology, this idol worship of stuff, that the vanity of it the, the, the lust of it, the, the, the finding desire in it, the, the finding satis- trying to find satisfaction in it. So he says, come out of her. Flee. Be separate. You know, in our day and age, there used to be a lot of Messages about separation from the world. And then somewhere along the line, we said, well, every time the pastor says anything about worldliness or separation, black guy must be a legalist. He must be a legalist. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with your heart. It has everything to do with where you are finding your satisfaction where your love is. 
Because it's not a matter of measuring your luxury. Whether you're living in those days or these days, it's not a matter of going, well, you know, there's always somebody who has more. So they must be. It's the Ludwigs of our society. It's their fault. They're the ones that have to watch this. I'm okay. It's not a matter of material. It's materialism. It's not a matter of luxury. It's a matter of lust and love. Lust and love. So it speaks to the heart. It gets to the heart of this issue. And here the text is clearly saying, listen, don't be come indoctrinated by this. Flee. Get out. Do not participate. Because God's judgment is coming. He gives two reasons. One, he says, don't participate in her sins. The idea of participation is fellowship, partaking. There's a connection with, to be partner with. Don't take up an earthly enterprise with this ideology in this heart. And then the second reason there is that you might not receive her plagues. And this is direct language that we could link back to chapter 16, talking about the last several bold judgments. Well, that's the, um, the appeal, the appeal for separation. Now, uh, chap- uh, verses 6 and 8 through 8 talk about the mount of retribution. As a part of this, uh, of this proclamation of judgment, there is an unfolding that God is going to give back double fold on the city, on the system. The same voice is calling for repentance to flee. God's mercy is called for God's harshest, intensive judgment against this idolatrous Babylon and those who are part of the system. He says in verse 6, pay back even as she has been paid. Give back double according to her deeds in the cup which she has mixed. Mixed twice as much. It's not diluted. The strength is added added twice. This language comes from the the ancient law of retribution. An eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. Some specific um, offenses are listed here. She is self-satisfied, notice, to the degree that she has glorified herself. She has lifted herself up in pride. Number two, she is self-gratifying. She lived sensuously to the same degree. Give her torment and mourning. Number three, she's self-sufficient. Notice, for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow. I will never see mourning. She's self-sufficient. She doesn't need God. Judgment is going to come and tell her otherwise. And the consequences for her rebellion against God will be her destruction, verse 8. For this reason, in one day, that is, her plagues will come very, very quickly. Pestilence, mourning, famine. She will be burned up with fire. And the Lord God who judges her is strong. This is reminiscent, by the way. Predictions of Babylon's demise throughout the Old Testament, but still awaiting its ultimate fulfillment. Jeremiah 50, verse 29. Pay back her according to her work, according to all that she has done. Do it to her. She has often, uh, for she has become arrogant against the Lord and stand against the Holy One of Israel. She has taken her stand and she is going to get double back. Retribution is coming. So what is the response here? What is the response 
to this proclamation of judgment. Do those who are caught up in the system, do they flee? Do they seek separation? Do they seek salvation? No. No. That's largely because of the delusion that has come. And that delusion has strike. And it strikes many in our day and age. We say again, oh, materialism? I don't have that much material. You don't have to have any material to be materialistic. That's a condition of the heart. That is a perspective of the will. That is a matter of idolatry. Hedonism, the same. We have a way of fooling ourselves. So again, we would ask, we pause and just ask ourselves a hard question. Where is our heart in all of this? Where do we find true satisfaction? Have we been indoctrinated by the world? Or are we clinging to the cross of Christ, finding our glory in, in Christ? Well, let's carry on and look at the great world lamentation over the judgment of, uh, over judgment by the benefactors. The response, look at the response of the world. Look at the response of the entire world. All those who are being benefited by uh, her idolatry. All those who are being benefited by her, their materialism and, and this great economic power. And all of a sudden it goes up in smoke. And what is the response? Verse 9, and the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will be filled with weeping and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will weep and lament. Again, this is worldly lamentation because of the judgment by those who are being benefited by her weep and lament that is cry aloud start a funeral funeral dirge it's going to be a death of a city the point is to see that the object of their trust and the source of their happiness is going up in smoke. It's becoming unglued. The details of the life are just given up and, and happiness is gone. It's been incinerated. Notice when they see the smoke of her burning, the timing of this burning of the bowls, judgment, the end of the tribulation, very, very close to the return of Jesus Christ. They're standing at a distance because of fear. It appears they have heard of her destruction and neither come to see or view it. And of course, commentators of old say it seems like they're, you know, they're viewing it. But how, how can the whole world see one event? Pretty easy, right? Pretty easy. They're standing there and they're looking with fear, trepidation. Not fear that's going to lead them to repentance, but they are mourning over their loss of benefit. They're mourning be because they have not heeded 1 John that says worldliness is passing away. And for them it has passed away and has gone up in smoke. Everything that they have lived for, everything that they've worked for, everything that they've put their heart, soul, mind and strength to, it's all gone. So they can't weep loud enough. They can't mourn deep enough. They're crushed. And the kings of the earth, look at the leaders and the kings of the world here. We talked about their leadership under the leadership of the Antichrist who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her. They, they weeped over her. And the kings who are totally dependent on Babylon for their power, yet with all their armies and resources and science and technology, they're unable to do anything to save the city. They're standing at a distance. And notice what they say, woe, woe, great, the great city Babylon, the strong city. 
It has been reduced to nothing. It's gone. All our hopes are gone. Our treasure, gone. Our effort, gone. Our business, gone. It's all gone. Well, one hour, your judgment is calm. It comes suddenly. It comes devastation. <clears throat> Look at verses 11 through 17. <clears throat> you see the, the businessmen, along with the, the leaders of the world, the businessmen. The, the merchants of the earth keep weeping and mourning over her because no one buys their cargo anymore. It's all gone. Verse 11. Verse 14. The fruit you long for has gone from you and all the things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you and men will no longer find them. The disbelief of the merchants has an intense it is intense here. Look at verse 15. And the merchants of these things who become rich from her will stand at a distance because of fear of her torment, weeping and mourning. Whoa, whoa, great city. She is clothed with fine linen and purple, uh, purpose and scarlet, adorned with gaunt, precious stones and pearls for the hour such great wealth has been laid wet and waste. It's all gone. Gone. Look at the distribution centers here. Verse 17. Every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor, as many as made their living by the sea, stood at a distance and were crying as they saw the smoke of her burning. What a city like this is great. Notice what they keep saying. The lamentation, on the one hand, the city, the great city, it's not so great anymore. The lie has been exposed. The truth has come out. Their hope has been incinerated, their treasure exploded, their faith doomed. Look at verse 19. And they threw dust on their heads, and they were crying, mourning, and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, great city in which all who had ships by the sea became rich by her wealth. For one hour she has become laid waste. Listen, man is pretty uh, ingenious here. They, they've made for themselves great wealth. These are good businessmen, that is, they, they, they know how to produce stuff. And the fact that they can do that in the midst of all of the judgments that have been going on in the last seven years leading up to this, pretty impressive. But now the gloves have come off and now it has hit the system and it has hit the system so hard there is nothing left of it. It's never going to be recovered. All there is left to do, the last item on the agenda for these businessmen is to throw dust on their heads. That's all they got left. A sign of mourning. Something has died. The system and the city and their hopes have all died. That is the end of all materialism. That is the end of all hedonism. That is the end of all worldliness. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Ecclesiastes says to us time and time again. Living for, in the world. And being all about the world. And taking up all the worldly treasures. You're just. It's gonna, you're going to die. And that that's what you live for. All you're going to have is dust and ashes. But what's heaven's evaluation like? Let's look at this really quickly. Heaven's evaluation is dramatically different. Look at verse 20. Verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, you saints and, pro and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment 
for you against her. Again, we have a commandment here. This is a command. Rejoice. It's in a passive sense. And so there is a command to be happy, to rejoice, to make, uh, to make merry. To allow yourself to receive happiness, joy, and uh, based on the truth of God's word and the destruction of God's enemy here. This is the long-awaited retribution moment. And we were commanded, and the people, the believers are commanded to celebrate. This is the heavenly evaluation of judgment from heaven. All heaven breaks out. Why? Because that which is artificial, that which is a lie, that, that which is, is deception, that which has been robbing uh, people from their real treasure is gone. The truth has come out. And the opposition has been desecrated. Look at the depictions here. In verses 21 through 23. Then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea and said, So Babylon, great city, throw down and with violence and will not be found any longer. Have you ever taken, you go, you go to the lake shore and you do some skipping of the stones? Well, that's nice. You get, you get bored of skipping the stones and stones. And so you and your buddies, you grab the biggest rock that you can. You know, and you go, heave ho, and it does that, plunk, and it plashes up. That's what this is. There's a sudden devastation. It's been submerged suddenly in devastation. Like a great millstone thrown into the sea. Continues to go on. The sound of the harpists and the musicians and the flute players and the trumpets will no longer be heard. Nothing, nothing to write music about. This is devastating. There'll be no more industry, no craftsmen or any craft will be found in you any longer. Nothing to make, no home goods, no manufactured goods, it's all gone. There'll be no cooking. The sound of a mill will not be heard any longer. There'll be no more light. And the light of the lamp will not shine in you anymore. There'll be no electricity, no power, no light. And five, there'll be no falling in love, marriage, or celebrations of any kind. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. And that's heaven's assessment. Heavenly a celebration. Listen, all of that with which you thought was going to be, bring you pleasure and bring you satisfaction, you can't. It's gone. It's been taken away from you. In judgment. You see the end of it. You see the vanity of it. Verses 23 and 24 the severity of the judgment then is again justified and explained through three provisions. One, the financial manipulation and materialism for your merchants were great men of earth. And number two, the indoctrination because the nations were uh, received by your sorcery or deceived, excuse me, by your sorcery and the perception of God's people that in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all have been slain on the earth. Again, all of this is not about luxury. It's about love and about lust. So this morning we saw the proclamation of the judgment. We saw the worldly lamentation over the judgment. And we saw the heavenly reaction and celebration over the judgment. God is going to reveal the truth. God ultimately, uh, constantly gives us judgment through our own idolatry. And that's the picture here. We start off with a heavenly, angelic proclamation and even warning. We have the worldly 
reaction. It's a real reaction. It's an eye-opening reaction. All of this material, the culmination of the most materialistic culture in the world will go up in smoke. And the only thing they'll be able to say is, whoa, that city was great and now it's no more. That's it. That's it. And then the heavenly response, celebrate, because the imitation has been annihilated. And by the way, the reality, the substance is coming. It's right around the corner. It's in chapter 19. Jesus is coming. He's coming back. He's coming back. And he's going to usher in his kingdom. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this uh, time to be together. We thank you for this word of warning, this prophecy. Lord, that's coming in the future, but we realize that there are things which we need to apply in our own life. So help us to measure our own hearts. Father, help us to diagnose <clears throat> our own treasure. Lord, are we looking? Are we looking for your return? Or Lord, have we been satisfied with worldliness, materialism, self-centeredness? <coughs> Bring to us re <coughs> repentance where repentance is needed and restore unto us the celebration of the joy of your return in, in anticipation of your return. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat>